President George Bush was head of the CIA. He has said that he is going to increase covert action activities of the CIA. Well, we're going to talk with former CIA official John Stockwell and see what the status is of the actions going on right now across the world, places like Afghanistan, Central America, Southern Africa, and Cambodia. One of the jobs which John had when he was in the CIA was to run the Angolan program. He later quit the CIA and wrote his famous book, In Search of Enemies. John, George Bush has inherited quite a few covert operations from the Reagan administration. Can you provide an overview of the CIA's secret wars under Reagan and tell us what is likely to happen with these operations under Bush? This, this is the most fascinating period, perhaps, of the Cold War because there is the suggestion, the rumor afoot, if you will, that the Cold War is coming to an end. The Russians are withdrawing from the battlefield and it's all over. Uh, that's not going to happen. I, I was just in London conferring with a number of people, including Tody Ben of the Labor Party, talking about just that sort of thing. Uh, what Bush is going to do is put the covert back in covert actions. Uh, Reagan wanted to be the cowboy showing the world how he stood up to communism in Nicaragua and bombed Libya and did dramatic things. Or to put it another way is, is Bush is going to use Vaseline as he proceeds with the rape <laughs> of the world and get it back into more of an old school. They're bragging, of course, big about Afghanistan. Reagan, as he went out of office, uh, cited all of his peace victories. Angola, you know, of course, a big one. Uh, he was a little bit quiet on Nicaragua because he had sworn that he would not go out of office with the Sandinista still in office, and they did outlast him. Uh, El, El Salvador is probably the hottest spot. As I see it, if you measure it in terms of where the United States might be provoked to put in U.S. troops and have our next war, could very well be El Salvador. Uh, Campuchia, uh, they're citing that as another big victory. We've got the Russians from withdrawing from, you know, the Cubans <coughs> from Angola, the Soviets from Afghanistan, the Vietnamese from, uh, from Campuchia. But uh, a as we get into the discussion, you peel off the layer of the cover story and you start finding very quickly the cynicism going on full of pace. And the basic point I think that, that I would register is that we got a lot of energy from Reagan's cowboy style. He wanted the world to debate contra aid instead of focus on the fact that Reaganomics had run up the biggest debt in the history of the world. And so he was focusing attention there, but there were 21 uh, low intensity conflicts going that the CIA was a major participant in and the only one that got any remarkable coverage in the peace community or the press was Nicaragua and it was by no means the biggest in terms of money or in terms of lives lost. Now with, with uh, the, the Vaseline president uh, we're going to have a situation <laughs> working where we may not have that infusion of energy uh, from the White House, from the Congress, giving us the ammunition for our debates and rallies and, and a rallying point for the Peace Corps. Uh, a little bit harder for us to be sure what's happening in, in given countries, the sort of thing where it may come out five years later, like, like Chad with Woodward's coverage coming out, you know, years later. What was uh, that about? Well, back in the early 80s, uh, Woodward's book, Veil, there was some coverage at the time, uh, Time Newsweek, but the CIA put two consecutive invasions, uh, or forces together, from the Sudan to move into Chad to take power, to counter uh, Gaddafi and, and, and uh, uh, his forces coming down from, from Libya. Uh, at the time it was happening, you don't get the coverage, you don't, it, they keep it secret if they want to. The Afghani operation is the biggest one in the history of the CIA, and they managed to divert, biggest in every sense, including the fact the largest heroin smuggling ring left right. behind. Uh, and they managed to, to keep it from, not secret, but keep it from being a, a, a focal point of debate for the six major years that it was run. How could it have been bigger than Vietnam? Because well, Vietnam was a CIA operation for years before the uh, army came in. and uh, Vietnam became the Vietnam War with U.S. Army, U.S. Air Force, billions of dollars. Uh, Laos had always been cited as the CIA's biggest uh, uh, war. Vietnam became an overt war. Laos remained a CIA secret war. And the hundreds of millions of dollars there uh, supported with Air Force bombing and everything. But Afghanistan is... Uh, 
They haven't published the figure. I've never been able to find anyone who confident like the archives, uh, National Security Archives, Scott Armstrong in Washington, a solid figure on how much they've spent in Afghanistan, but it's in the billions. John, let's, let's Biggest in the history. Mm -hmm. Let's go into Afghanistan in some uh, detail. I read in the New York Times just this morning that the Reagan administration was bragging that they refused to compromise with the Soviet Union to pull out their support for the Afghan rebels in exchange for the Soviets uh, pulling out. So let's see who the U.S. actually was supporting in Afghanistan over the last uh, years, what of the rebel forces, how they were supporting them, and what the effects of this have already been and might be as we now are moving to a new era for Afghanistan that could be total chaos. It looks like the Lebanonization of Afghanistan with yeah. all these different groups. The, yeah, first well, of all, well, there's so. all these different rebel groups. Who is the U.S. supporting out of the whole spectrum? I bet I saw him on TV yesterday. There was a guy they found who spoke good English. <laughs> and uh, he was clean shaven and looked like an old <laughs> McSaisai type from the Philippines. They, they, um, I'm going to hedge a little okay. bit because this is not an area of my primary expertise and I've not been able to travel there and look at it like I did in Nicaragua and El Salvador and Angola and all of that. But it, it, you, you essentially have it. We do have it. Uh, we, we, the, the Admiral Turner, when, when I debated him at uh, Colby College, he cited, he was boasting about that covert action that he had started it mm -hmm. and citing it as an example of a successful covert operation. Uh, they set it in motion and then eventually it led to the Soviets having to withdraw their troops. Uh, the game that they're playing, essentially the U.S., uh, the parallel to Vietnam it is significant. We invaded, they invaded, uh, or, or cre each created governments that invited us in, so to speak. Uh, the difference is in the breakup, of course, at the end, the NLF would not compromise in Vietnam. The, the, the Tom Polgar scandal we've talked about before, the chief of station hoping they would give the U.S. a break, and they had no reason to. They had the U.S. down and, and dirty and were going to uh, humiliate us uh, as effectively as they could. This is essentially what Reagan is doing in Afghanistan, but the difference is that in Vietnam, the other side had, had created a, a very cohesive force to, in an orderly way to move in and take power and administrate and run the country, the NLF, uh, and, and Hanoi and the government and everything. What we've been doing in Afghanistan is just pure and simple uh, uh, shotgun uh, destabilization, funding anybody that's got a group, giving them arms through Pakistan, every kind of group, as you say, the Lebanization, uh, so that now we, we're, we've won in the sense that, that Reagan is crowing and Turner is crowing and Carter is crowing. You, you heard that mm -hmm. on the news yesterday, that his policies had been vindicated and all of that. And the Russians are pulling out, admitting that they made a big mistake. In fact, they're probably being more candid than we were when we pulled out of Vietnam. Right. We tried to say it was an honorable this and everything. They're just saying flat, we made a mistake, right. a tragic mistake. But we have not created a force, our government, our movement, or anything that believes in anything, to step into the, the vacuum. I debated, uh, or I thought I was going to debate an Afghani professor at the World Affairs Conference in Boulder last year, uh, and who, because he was paid working for the VOA and so U.S. propaganda arm, so I presumed he was bought and paid for. And he kept telling me, you know, just let me finish my sentence, so to speak. And I did. And what he said is what the, what the powers have done is condemned Afghanistan to eternal violence and conflict. Yes, it looks like it's going to be horrible. They're pulling out, and, and this side is not going to agree to relent, and the Soviets are going to uh, see uh, what they would call a necessity to keep arming the other side. This is where you get into uh, a test, if you will, of... Gorbachev's sincerity and Bush's, you know, kinder, gentler, you know, goodness in the nation. Uh, do they really mean it? They're trying to convince the world that the Cold War is winding down. Doonesbury's already told us the Cold War is, war is over. Uh, it isn't. Hmm. Now, the danger, of course, is that people uh, are so eager, craving for hope and craving for peace. Uh, it doesn't take much. As, as dynamic as the peace movement arguably uh, is in the United States and, and Europe, for example, it sure doesn't take much for a president to get up there and just 
three words. Uh, kinder, gentler, and then the goodness, goodness and greatness, four words. And people, oh wow, Phew, you know. It's yeah. right. Whereas the actual uh, policies are to keep uh, violence and covert operations and secret wars going. So your point about the U.S. intervention in Afghanistan, rather than negotiating a peaceful settlement, we're negotiating some sort of a governmental structure. We just supported any forces whatsoever to create chaos in the region to humiliate the Soviet Union. That that was the goal and continues to be the goal of the Bush administration that continues to fund the Afghan rebels to make sure there's more murder, chaos, et cetera. There. What does Bush, how can he justify continuing to support the Afghan rebels now that the Soviet Union has pulled out? There's no longer a foreign oppressor. There well, to this is just this is just classic old Cold War. The elephants fighting, you know, and the grass getting trampled. Uh, uh, w we haven't had our victory over there yet. I'm putting it in mm -hmm. in their terms, in Bush's terms, the CIA's terms. Uh, it is in the process of happening. We haven't taken Kabul yet. We haven't installed any kind of a government uh, that, other than what the Soviets left behind. And so they're pressing ahead. And it's going to be very much in Bush's interest to try to get them to moderate the violence and the bloodiness of the revolution. Uh, the, the last great successful revolution from the other side was the Sandinistas, and they abolished the death sentence. Mm. Uh, the thing that's happening now with the U.S. forces, U.S. backed forces, as they say, uh, in Afghanistan, apparently, is just utter atrocities when they take a city and then, and then they lose it, perhaps. Uh, there are great crates full of dismembered bodies, you know, meat stuck in, in crates of, of hundreds of uh, bodies left behind. Horror uh, beyond comprehension. Perpetrated by the rebels? By the, by the U.S.-backed forces, the different ones. But there's and, different ones. There's no mm -hmm. one force that the U.S. expects will take over. No, uh, the U.S. is working very hard, I am sure, to try to get its... So they have some secret strategy of oh. some forces that they hope Absolutely. will take over. Absolutely. They hope to take uh, the capital and establish a government and then reinforce that government as it dominates the others and, and establishes some kind of peace in the country. The process is going to be extremely bloody. And the U.S. will be doing its very best with the U.S. media, probably mm -hmm. uh, not giving us the vivid clippings of the horrors, you know, as they're happening, just as they're not doing it in El Salvador or Guatemala today. But couldn't there be an embarrassment for the U.S. if it turns out to be a bloodbath, that the U.S. supported rebels turn out to be barbaric and there's atrocities committed everywhere? Well, there is a bloodbath happening right, right now, right. and it's just not being run in our media. The media and, and that, I mean, we're not the, being told about the U.S. And the the CIA have done this uh, continually through the years. That's absolutely right. In South right. Vietnam, in Iran with the Shah, in uh, El Salvador. With uh, different degrees. Bloodbaths all the time. But, and with different degrees of collusion from the press. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, in, in, in Central America, for example, in 81, when, when Reagan was first plunging in, the media, they had crews all over Nicaragua. They had permanent offices set up for all the biggies in the Intercontinental Hotel. And... Uh, and then after the Falkland Islands, they made a decision and didn't send them back. The stuff was running on the evening news every day, the horror st you know, stories and visual imagery, and they shut it off as the media bought into Reagan's Contra program. And, uh, and, you know, the Office of Public Diplomacy and the painting the white hats, as they put it, on the Contras and the black hats on the Sandinistas and the media, the Washington Post, the, the biggies cooperating. Uh, and they're clearly cooperating in Afghanistan. Otherwise, we would be having f much more graphic footage and graphic explanations of what's happening in Afghanistan right now today. There's and it's nothing. going to get worse for the, right. yeah, for the next year. All they call them the freedom fighters, yeah. and that's it. But there's been nothing on U.S. support of any specific groups or what the effects of supporting these groups are. See, this is exactly what I'm saying. This is the biggest one in the history of the CIA, mm -hmm. and there's been nothing about it. The, the, and part of the reason is it's been a full bipartisan. The Contra program was public, and there was debate on it, and, and at times it was voted down. It was a close vote. There were 
serious differences. Uh, in the Afghani, it's virtually unanimous. Both sides of the House and the Congress or, or the Senator are fully behind it, and so there has, and the administration didn't want to provoke a debate on it, mm -hmm. and the media was willing to, to go in and give us a glimpse now and then, but not map it out for us. They give they you mainly the glimpse of the Soviet atrocities, mm -hmm. or it appears that it was the Soviet occupation that's creating all of the bloodshed, that this is a legitimate revolutionary or counter-revolutionary force. But they don't go into any detail of how the U.S. is supporting these groups. And there's also nothing about the drug running of these no. different rebel drugs to say the... And, and of course there's nothing about the CIA actually helping these rebel forces with their drug running to help support their um, military uh, struggles against the Soviets. Without mention of the CIA program and the secret war, you do pick up articles about, you know, the drug allocations around the world or, mm -hmm. or, and the, the Golden Crescent is now the largest source of heroin apparently in the world today, right in there where the CIA has been running this operation with its C-130s and C-123s flying in with arms and flying out with the heroin. What's the evidence that that's happening? I mean, I haven't even read anything about this, the CIA heroin route. In well, there have been a lot of things in Covert Action Information Bulletin where yeah, they're yeah. traced. Well, first of all, historically, the rebels, the groups, have been big dope uh, uh, operators for years. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the things that the, uh, the communist government which later became backed by the Soviet Union, uh, was trying to do away with. They were trying to eliminate drugs from their country. They were trying to have establish health and education. They were trying to have some uh, women's lib, give them a chance, and do away with slavery. Right. But when they started doing this to, and to eliminate some of those drug runners, well, then that's one of the big groups that this, uh, it's so an arm. it's so it's sufficiently flagrant and open and uh that it was the theme of the last james bond movie as a matter of fact set in afghanistan with these huge plane loads of of, of heroin mm -hmm. john there's a byproduct of this we're assuming that the activities of the cia in afghanistan will lessen somewhat as a result of this do you suppose not for two or three years. No, they'll be very busy uh, funding uh, the CIA and the paramilitary, the invisible government, the entire mm -hmm. spectrum of it, uh, to build a solid government that, that with the death squads to pacify the country. Uh, I look for a tremendously troubled uh, situation to go on several years, so, at best. I see. Like Lebanon, with yeah. every single faction fighting in a situation where no faction can gain control. As that Afghani professor said with, with just visible anguish, he said they have condemned Afghanistan to eternal violence. Wow. So there won't be any unemployed... Uh, covert action no. hot dogs from the CIA who be available and looking for work in the rest of the world no, like, ha like it happened in Vietnam for instance. No, they'll just be, uh, they'll just be quieter uh, and, and that will be the difference. They'll try to keep it out of sight instead of like the Contra program uh, posturing for the press and provoking public confrontations. Let's look at another place, South Africa. South Africa is so-called getting out of Angola, but they did before and then they came right back in again when there was, uh, it looked like there was going to be peace in the area. Now, it looks like the same thing happened. They had, the, they're getting the Cubans to pull out. They got their ears pinned back. They pulled away. But now I understand, the, I heard where they've actually made some more armed attacks Already. on Angola. Three, three weeks ago in London, in the interviews and discussions, this is very much what we were talking about, was, was uh, what is the guarantee that South Africa is going to respect this? The Cubans pull out, uh, South Africa pulls out, what's going to keep? South Africa is violating every uh, international law and boundary in southern Africa. What's going to keep them from going back into Angola? How long will it be before they put their troops back in? And the answer was two weeks. Yeah. And Now, interestingly enough, Washington's reaction on this, of course, Reagan had a a big aid program to Savimbi, and uh, mm -hmm. Bush has promised to continue it, and obviously is clearly doing so. Now, Savimbi's pinned down on the border down there now, uh, militarily, uh, and, and is a little better off than the Contras are, and he was taking a beating, so the South African forces came in to bail him out. The U.S. 
uh, response. They, they obviously didn't stand up and say, well, we happen to be in there in force with the CIA and we call the South Africans in. Their, their, their statement was, I can just remember, you know, back in the task force, scribbling away the wording on the statement, you know, to put... When you were running the Angola yeah, operation. Please. When we were running, uh, you, you, their, their answer was that it has not been confirmed uh, uh -huh. by any reliable sources that the <laughs> South Africans are, in fact, back in Angola. We they should, are. in fact, tell our audience that John Stockwell was the CIA um, officer in charge of the Angola operation and resigned after that wrote his book, In Search of Enemies, that began his process of developing a criticism of the CIA and has been speaking out as a peace activist um, ever since. So Angola has basically been a hot point for the whole Reagan administration. Well, let's strip uh, Angola down just yeah. real briefly while we're on the subject. Chester Crocker, Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, uh, was talking to some of us uh, in the Africanist uh, progressive side of things, Jerry Bender particularly at uh, the International School at USC, and promising that he was going to negotiate a settlement for Namibia and get the Cubans out of Angola. And uh, Jerry, whom I, a friend whom I respect enormously, said that, you know, if you succeed, we'll give you credit for it publicly. And Crocker succeeded. He pounded away and negotiated away, and it took six years, and eventually he worked out a deal where the South Africans would give Namibia its independence and the Cubans would go home. And the Cubans are going home and it's a real deal. And the South Africans are, you know, there is uh, uh, at least some kind of a farcical uh, independence being uh, given to Namibia. Uh, the oversight, is it going to work? Are the UN forces going to cover it? Are death squads going to be left behind to keep a proxy control? You know, that question remains. But still, uh, Bender and, and I supporting him were obliged to say, yes, you know, Crocker, you did, you did it. Uh, Namibia finally is getting its independence. However, in that fascinating, complex deal, the Cubans are coming home, South Africa is giving independence to Namibia uh, and, and getting out of Angola and promising to stay out even. Though, but the United States, although right. arbitrating that thing, did not promise to cease its aid to Savimbi to destabilize Angola. Now that is brass. But it's also like, just idiotic. I mean, it just, it sort of confirms your thesis in search of enemies, that the role of the CIA is to search out enemies, to fight wars, to destabilize the world. Here's a region that needs stability. There's negotiations to try to uh, stabilize it, and the U.S. keeps supporting these rebel forces to try to overthrow the Angola government that led to the, oh, the absolutely bizarre situation of the Cubans there that were supporting the Soviet-backed Angolan government protecting the U.S. multinational corporations. I think Gulf Oil had big... Gulf Oil, which was bought out by there, Chevron. That the Cubans were protecting yeah. against the CIA-backed Angolan rebel forces. So there's no, it's not even in U.S. economic interest when to Savimbi, destabilize Angola. When Savimbi was brought to Washington in the winter of 86, remember, he, he, uh, he, was, he, was, he dined at the White House, and yet he, w he went on television promising the aid that he was being given that he would attack Gulf oil facilities, which facilities had been built by loans which Reagan had approved, in addition to which he has kept the central part of Angola frozen and the Benguela Railroad shut, and that's a Zaire, our big client's only economically viable egress to the sea, is that railroad that we pay Savimbi to keep shut. Meanwhile, uh, the human horror, the, the Red Cross counts 55,000 people in Angola who have been maimed by Savimbi's landmines wow. and attacks. And George Bush I'm, continues to support those forces. Yeah. John, uh, wow. one of the analyses that I heard about the, the situation was that there was pressure within South Africa to get out. They wanted to get out of the Angolan situation. Uh, they didn't want to uh, support it financially, and also there were problems because their soldiers were getting killed. So the United States said, okay, go ahead, pull out. We'll come in and we'll directly supervise the situation and take care of it. So it wasn't a big victory for the Angola government or for Cuba in that respect. It was just a switch of people who were going to control it. Well, this, yeah, this is exactly the point I was trying to make, is that I, uh, us, Crocker playing big arbitrator, and we didn't agree to give the region peace. But it is a fact that Namibia is getting its independence. 
the, the, the South Africa is going to try to do what we did to Nicaragua in 1933 when we pulled the Marines out and created the guard and left it behind with Samosa, you know, in charge. They're trying to create the same type of a situation and have a proxy control of it. Uh, from the Cuban point of view, the Angolans are, are being left facing a dire situation with Savimbi still being funded to, to destabilize and the South Africans still coming across the border and the Cubans coming home. And uh, in Cuba's uh, interests, and, and it's, it's very difficult to fault them because they've, uh, they, they've sacrificed a lot of their own and their own capital to the extent that they can, and they're not a wealthy country uh, to, to stick up for their allies, the Angolans. But this is the point at which they could, in fact, come home with uh, uh, having accomplished, uh, you know, a measurable objective. But it's Namibia is independent because of what they did. Yet the independence of Namibia or any country in Africa is precarious because of the CIA presence there. Whenever an independent African nation takes a socialist road or a road that goes against the interests or ideologies of the CIA, they destabilize the government. Kwame Nkrumah wrote a book called Class Struggles in Africa that documented the ways that the CIA overthrew about 25 progressive governments in Africa, including Nkrumah's own uh, Gandhian government in the 1960s. So if Namibia takes a route that the CIA doesn't like, they can act to destabilize it one way or the other. So that's really the precarious situation that all independent nations in Africa face. This is one of Chomsky's best points, is that uh, when the U.S., when a country tries to escape, our first effort is to bludgeon them back into the fold. And if that fails, uh, as it did in Cuba, conspicuously, as it did in Vietnam, conspicuously, as it's done in Angola to date, and Nicaragua to date, then the fallback is to starve them out create economic chaos so that they will not be a positive example to anyone else to want to break free. And uh, this, is, this is what Nicaragua is facing today. They won the first round. They survived six years of constant uh, uh, heavy-duty military destabilization of the countryside. The Contras collapsed in corruption and chaos and shambles and their own cowardice. And now a plan is afoot to disband them altogether, disband the camps and everything. But Nicaragua is now going to face a vigorous destabilization from the U.S. government. There's this uh, Flora Lewis op-ed piece that was in the New York Times a couple of days ago, the Austin American Statesman today, where she summarizes the situation. A good piece, well done. Except she talks about freedom of the press and she mentions La Prensa and she does mm. not mention the fact that it was funded by the CIA during this whole period. And they were pro-contra during the whole period. Oh, absolutely. A CIA propaganda piece to, to destabilize the country. To create during penance. a war, no less, yeah. when they were, they were fighting for their survival. She not, should have yeah. mentioned that. It's a good article. Mm -hmm. I compliment her. But still, that little detail, and then she doesn't project it further. The Meldon plan isn't mentioned. Uh, where, where the ambassador was, was funding the, d during the height of peace talks and the Contras and Amnesty, Contras and the, 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 the embassy was caught uh, funding people and organizing them to agitate and to violence to provoke The U.S. It. Embassy was yeah. funding Ambassador a uh, opposition. Let's focus on this Contra thing for a while. I read today in the New York Times that the Bush administration seemed to be surprised that the leaders of these Central American governments had the audacity to shut down the Contras, to tell them they had to leave Honduras. Evidently, the Reagan-Bush administration thought they'd cut a deal with the Honduran government that the Contras could stay there as long as money was being funneled into uh, um, Honduras. And evidently, the Bush administration was caught by surprise with this meeting and doesn't exactly know how to react. How do you read this? Situation. Well, it, re it reminds me of an old saw, the, the bandy in the third world saying, you can, you can rent us sometimes, but you can't buy us. <laughs> and uh, every time uh, the Honduran generals would need, you know, another, put some more money in their bank accounts, they would talk about throwing the Contras out. And it is an embarrassment mm -hmm. to them. Flagrant violation of, of all of their own internal laws and uh, the international agreements in Central America. And, uh, but each time they would uh, propose to close down the contrabases, Reagan would hit them with another 20 mil in cash 
to the generals and, and quiet them down for another year. And I would have to say that either the forces of peace in Central America are sufficient that Honduras really is trying to get rid of this embarrassment, uh, or the generals want another payment. Do you think the Bush, will, the Bush administration will try to buy them um, off? How would they do it? Would they have to go to Congress for money, or could they just siphon? Break, well, they have all kinds of contingency funds, mm -hmm. and you can, you know, 20 million they could squeeze out, but we'll, mm -hmm. let's watch and see. Is Reagan going to hit the Honduran government with a, a lump of money, or is he going to let them close down the Contra bases? Well, what is the military situation with the Contras? I gain the impression that the Contras have pretty much closed down in terms of interventions into uh, Nicaragua, that for a while they were quite an active fighting force, but that this is pretty much wound down now. Is it that they're demoralized, they've left the region, they don't have the funding, the supplies? What is the situation? No, disintegration. Two years ago, the Sandinistas were giving them credit for some pretty serious uh, uh, activity in this, uh, up and down through the country, reaching pretty far in. Uh, they were not standing up to the Sandinistas in any pitched battles, but their raids and hitting and running, there was, there was quite a bit of energy. Uh, now there are occasional atrocities measured you know, inside Nicaragua where there's apparently a band here or there, but the leadership has collapsed. They have a sense the U.S. is going to drop funding them, uh, that we've shut down the great air wing that was, that was funding them through the drug money. Uh, the leaders are looking for everybody scurrying to make sure they have some money in the bank so they can retire. And those soldiers that were you know, expected to go and live in the jungle with, without being resupplied, without the planes coming in to get them, the thing is, is probably down to 5% or, or less of the energy that they had two years ago. And then the talk about just disbanding the camps altogether. And this is enough of uh, the little things, you, signals you look for here and there that, you know, what's really going on. Reagan, uh, in, in his last couple of months, commented that the United States should be willing to accept the Contras up here. And that's pretty much of an admission on his part that, that you know, that they have to go somewhere. Boy, that's something that just uh, galls me. Every time there's the U.S. or the CIA you lose a big one, we bring in all of these murderers and dope dealers and uh, people who committed horrible butcheries and atrocities, we welcome them back into our country where they continue to do the same thing here. Which is precisely, isn't it, the issue down in South Texas right now, the so-called Nicaraguan refugees uh, coming up here, the ones who are supposedly fleeing the Sandinistas. Uh, these were clearly Contra supporters. And the U.S. has not really got that clear a policy. In fact, the, the only group that we just totally welcomed was the Cuban exile group that we had run from Florida that has been a constant embarrassment uh, to the United States government and the source of a major upheav upheaval in crime and drug smuggling. And uh, there's quite a block of sane people in this country, not of our politics, but nevertheless sane who are saying, well, we don't want them up here. We don't need they, another mafia. We have a Vietnamese <laughs> mafia, a Cuban <laughs> mafia. Um, the, 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 anyone, any, I mean, some of them have read Christopher Dickey's book, you know, with, with the Contras about his patrol, about Las Suicidas, just this in, incredible that? vendetta and orgy of violence down in the country. And no, we don't want these people up here. But you see, the Honduran government doesn't want them either. You remember uh, the... the <laughs> Maybe we can make them astronauts and shoot them out <laughs> into space. The Kurds, it's, they call it the disposal Except problem. Except Afghanistan. <laughs> yeah. The disposal, well, you have the Kurds, of course, in Iran, Iraq. And Henry Kissinger's famous statement when we were winding that one down, and the Shah said, it's not my problem, you've got to deal with them. And Kissinger recommended the Congress that we let them go. He said that uh, covert action is not to be confused with missionary work. Mm -hmm. So essentially the Kurds were just dropped and slaughtered. And, and slaughtered. Yeah. John, let's talk about uh, uh, El Salvador. Now, you, you said at the start of the program that that was going to be the next big, big place of contention. What has happened there that's different? It's, it's, uh, it's returned to the same. And New York Times, International Herald Tribune are writing repeated articles saying that the level of violence and dispute and instability in the country is back to where it was in 1982, 
when it was about to go down the tubes, it was, it was, all, it was breaking. The country could have gone, a revolution could have happened. And the U.S. began putting in uh, massive shipments that eventually became $3.3 billion worth of military aid. Uh, these big newspapers are w sort of warning the establishment that that's where we are right now today, counting the number of attacks on military camps by the so-called rebels in the capital, you know, in the last month. And elections are coming up in which uh, there's every appearance that the Arena Party will win, which is the right wing, you know, Dobby Sun's original creation. And... Uh, this, this is a situation where I think Bush is really desperate. I think, you know, his Vaseline principle, putting the covert back in it, I don't think he wants a showdown in El Salvador right now. He wants to sell this goodness for a while longer and keep things quiet until he's got his credibility up. But one thing that I said in England that I fear very much is the reason he and the media that supports him are working so hard on this goodness image is so that when he puts U.S. troops into El Salvador to keep it from going down the tubes, he'll be able to say, I'm a good guy, but, you know, I had to. Or to put it another way, he's faced with a dire challenge uh, to his, uh, his first real test there. If the country comes apart, if it starts to go, if the revolution starts to really succeed, the oligarchy is already uh, back to the 82 position of decapitalization, of taking their money out. Uh, in case it blows so they won't be caught with it in the San Salvador banks. If it goes, then he's going to have to either, one, put U.S. Marines in there at just a point in history where the Soviets are pulling theirs out of Afghanistan, right. and uh, the world's not going to like that, and the people in the U.S. aren't going to like that, or he's going to take historical credit for, quote, letting El Salvador go down the tubes, as, as Carter was blamed, for example, for, for Iran and Nicaragua. And uh, he's not going to want to do that. He's not going to be comfortable, uh, you know, the conservative uh, element of his being and his, his presidency. They're not going to be happy to let a revolution actually happen in El Salvador. I see them as utterly desperate right now trying to work out some kind of a compromise and keep the lid on. Well, how can they do that if the rebel forces are about to win a military uh, battle? Is there a possibility of negotiating a, a settlement? This is one thing that the Bush-Reagan forces just haven't done. They have always used the big stick. I mean, covert secret wars has been their uh, method. And well, you, no you notice in El Salvador, and this is just mm -hmm. in the last few weeks, the rebels proposed to participate in the elections. Yeah. If the elections can be put back six months, so they'll have time to realistically, and Duarte immediately said, no, absolutely not. That would be unconstitutional. No way. <laughs> And Bush, uh, his White House, said, well, slow down. Maybe we can find a so way. So you think they may be forced to negotiate for the first time? Or face a, a, a desperate decision, mm. one that could be a, be a Bay of Pigs kind of a humiliation for George mm. Bush in the early days of his presidency. But it's another state of chaos right now in El Salvador. Is it not? not only are the rebel forces winning victories, but the death squads, from what I read, are also back into play so that in the city, you have these right-wing uh, death squads um, carrying out wholesale assassinations. And Bush's options are pretty limited. The Arena Party, it appears, is going to win. Mm -hmm. uh, if they do, their, their inclination to violence, of course, is, is well known, and they're all already into violence. Uh, the Congress is in a mood to cut off their military aid if the violence level goes up to a point beyond which they can no longer ignore it. And, uh, but if you cut away the military aid, then you don't have any carrot, as they put it, to induce them to behave themselves. So the promise, as, as they are threatening, is that, well, in that case, you know, there would be no reason for us to restrain our soldiers, and a great bloodbath might ensue. So El Salvador, as, as a result uh, of, uh, in part, of our meddling in policies and support of creation, originally in the 60s, of the death squads, and then support of them, through today is faced with a real uh, terrible threat of, of a major upheaval like like occurred in the 30s. Where Another the, bloodbath where, where, the oligarchy, slaughter on, where the oligarchy got together in the 30s and said we're going to have to kill 30,000 people to keep the lid on things and that's about where they are right now. And that's what they did. And that's what they did. John, there is uh, an, another occurrence of a uh, socialist government pulling out of a neighbor. We mentioned it briefly before, Cambodia. Uh, 
when the Pol Pot regime was there and just murdering people by the millions, the Vietnamese went in and stabilized the country and put in a government. Then the United States and the Chinese su supported Pol Pot, the absolute butcher. Now the Vietnamese are pulling out of Cambodia. Now, what, uh, what's, what's going to happen there? Is it going to be a bloodbath like... Um, uh, hey, you Cambodia, remember like um, Afghanistan you spoke you you remember I I said back when the three big failures of the Carter administration from my point of view the contradictions that represented a betrayal uh, one of them was was scotching the 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 Olympics yeah. uh, for political reasons which was uh, betraying the athletics and the peace uh, athletic process of the world uh, another one was supporting Pol Pot, the greatest mass murderer of modern times after Henry Kissinger, perhaps, <laughs> uh, supporting him as the legitimate government at the United Nations when he had no power whatsoever inside the country, but Jimmy Carter did that. And the third thing, of course, was suing me and taking my profits away from my book and putting me under a court order. <laughs> Those were the reasons why I couldn't vote for Jimmy Carter in the 80 election. So what, but, are, the, what are the fruits of this well, uh, counter-Chia policy? See, for years, <laughs> we've been, it must be 10 years now, we've been supporting Paul Pot along with the Chinese. Are the Chinese still behind him too, or were they finally shamed into uh, dropping this character? Now, what they've got is four, four factions that are vying for power, and the U.S. has actually uh, made some policy statements saying that Pol Pot cannot be in charge of the, of the winning faction. But, but we, it, once again, we've created forces. Now, mind you, I was on my way back to Vietnam in 85, uh, the Vietnamese were opening up 10-year anniversary and the U.S. media went in and I, I went back with my lead to, to visit her family. And while we were traveling, uh, William Casey uh, and George Schultz toured the area and, and in Bangkok announced a new destabilization program against Vietnam in Cambodia. So we have created now, uh, putting our money in willy-nilly, we've created several factions and the Vietnamese, not that we've rocked their boat very successfully in Kampuchea, but the Russian economic policy, the Russia was underwriting that totally, uh, Vietnam's on its knees economically, and Russia was bankrolling that, and the Russians decided that that's one place they can cut you know, some of their losses and also win some goodwill with the United States. So the Vietnamese are pulling out, and we do not have control. We have created something that we don't have control of, with every possibility that we're going to see another major bloodbath in Kampuchea, for which we will be uh, in in part re responsible. In fact, going back, to, I guess it's 19 early 70s, uh, Kampuchea was pretty much out of the Southeast Asian wars until Nixon started secretly bombing the uh, country because he thought that North Vietnamese and Viet Cong forces were using Cambodia as a sanctuary. And because of U.S. bombings, that country was destabilized and got into a situation of total chaos. It was one of the most peaceful, uh, most beautiful countries in the world. That, the uh, bombings plus the CIA creation of the Lan Nau government, which right. went into the utter corruption, the, the standard pattern. And uh, this reminds me, by the way, in, in, uh, in London, some of the peace activists, they, 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 my, my conditions going over there is I would give four lectures, uh, including the one in, in the House of Commons, but that they would talk to me 50% of the time, so I would get their input, oh. and, uh, which was really uh, useful to me, getting Tony Benn to give his assessment of where socialism is going and where capitalism is going and where the Soviet Union is going, but they came to the hotel and played a video. They gave it to the hotel, and the hotel put it on a, mm -hmm. their internal video so I could watch it on the TV. Uh, uh, narrated by Eartha Kitt, called After the Fire, which is a study of the environmental war we waged in Vietnam and the mongoloid children that are being born today. And in my own province in Tay Ninh, where I was the officer in charge, they interviewed a nurse who was a, a, a midwife with two assistants, the only medical help in the province. And uh, they were saying that, that when a woman comes to us pregnant, we ask her where she lives, and we can tell her automatically 
whether or not she has a good chance of delivering a normal child just by where she lives. All the chemical warfare in Vietnam has destroyed this, this parts of the environment. This was the, the two greatest moments of shock that I felt in, as I've come into the peace movement. Uh, one of them was seeing the, 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 the children. In 83, I went down and actually held maimed children in Nicaragua. And the second one was seeing this film and just seeing what we deliberately did to the environment, killing the thousand-year-old trees and permanently poisoning the land, and seeing the 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 photograph, you know, the shots of the of the children that had been born since. John, is there any possibility of stopping these CIA wars? We've seen the uh, fruits that they uh, bear, which is death mayhem, destruction, chaos, etc. Is it possible to stop Bush and the secret wars? Bush himself was head of the CIA. He's obviously someone deeply committed to covert uh, action. While he smiles and talks about a kinder, gentler nation, he's supporting all of these uh, CIA operations. And he's so, been open and, and truthful about it. He says he supports them. But can this be stopped? I mean, could is there a mood in Congress or elsewhere in the uh, country that these are not helping anyone? They don't serve any real U.S. interests. They just destabilize and create chaos and death. They're totally immoral. They're irrational. Is there any sense that this is what's really going on and that it just has to be stopped? Well, I mean, I, Gorbachev I wanna... is evidently trying to create a saner, more rational Soviet uh, policy. So shouldn't the counterpart of that be in the U.S. to stop these uh, covert uh, wars? Well, I, I hate to keep pounding away like Dr. Gloom, <laughs> but... Uh, even even Glasnost, you know, there's a downside of Glasnost. Mm. We do have, like I say, Doonesbury announced the end of the Cold War. Okay. The nation, we've gotten the word out. There is a great movement in the nation, if you will, of, of revulsion, of saying these things are wrong. There's surprising people in the establishment. Bill Colby, who ran the Phoenix program and the CIs that did all these things, uh, said the Contra program was wrong and should be shut down, and then said that covert action should be gotten out of the CIA. Uh, you're finding uh, remarkable people saying that, acknowledging the fact that these things are wrong. What they're doing, however, as I say, is just putting the covert back into them and toning them down a little bit and trying to keep them out of the public consciousness mm -hmm. and trying to get the major media to cooperate with them and keeping them out of the public consciousness. I have to mention, however, uh, the downside of Glasnost, which people are, are overlooking, uh, as the Soviet Union invites openness and discussion and everything. But on the 7th of January, there was an uh, utterly remarkable op-ed piece in the New York Times, which is a reprint from the Soviet Foreign Ministry Journal uh, from last summer, done by Andrei Kozirov, in which he said, look, most of the third world has opted for the capitalist solution. It was a mistake for the, United, uh, for the USSR to support people's movements around the world. Uh, it led us into the, the nuclear arms race that's almost broken the Soviet economy. And in the Soviet economic interests, uh, we, he says, have to start supporting uh, stability and the status quo in the third world and, and join in the capitalist process in order to participate in world trade uh, in order to, to recover our own e economy and economic interests. Now, on the one hand, we should have a celebration because he's, a, and then Gorbachev at the United Nations said something uh, comparable. Now, you know, your first reaction is let's go out and have a, a, a celebration. Uh, because this does would seem to offer a hope that the thing, can, the Cold War, the brutalization of these countries, uh, can be shut down with the Soviet initiative and people fatigued of them in the United States. The problem is this: uh, there are two kinds of covert actions to oversimplify. Basically, uh, you see them clearly in, Nica in Central America, Nicaragua, with a Contra Freedom Fighters Destabilization Force, and in El Salvador, where we spent 3.3 uh, billion dollars on the death squads to, to maintain the status quo. To keep the revolutionary forces from winning. To keep actually. the people suppressed, to right. keep the oligarchies in power, to keep the dollars flowing, to keep the trade flowing at whatever price to the people. Now, if the Soviet Union proceeds to do what it's discussing publicly doing, it is openly saying that it's going to be cooperating with the United States, colluding with the United States, 
uh, to support for the El Salvadors, if you will, to support the status quo, which means there won't be anyone, uh, a major superpower, supporting the people's interests and the people's aspirations and hopes. Uh, and the two superpowers will be colluding to have better trade to dominate the third world. This would be a great step in the direction of the world security state. I mean, you've got, you know, let us not forget, wonderful as he may be, but uh, an ex-KGB guy in Moscow and an ex-CI director as president here. And that right, the right there tells you quite a bit about the movement of the world, not to mention the great, you know, peacenik in London, wasn't Margaret Thatcher. Gor Gorbachev was with the He KGB? has a KGB background, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was, wasn't this Henry Kissinger's uh, vision of the world, that the U.S. and the Soviet Union have a lot of common interests and they should get together and sort of divide up the world where each has their sphere of influence? Kissinger, of course, studied 19th century uh, Europe where they had carving up of Europe in spheres of uh, influence. So this has been his policies. Well, as a matter of fact, Kissinger published a paper, co-authored co a paper, which is discussed, I believe it's in the December issue of the Progressive Magazine, in which he's saying how the U.S. Bush, who had just won the election, should prepare to fight wars in the third world. Uh, that the Soviet Union, the, he, mentioning specific weapon systems that had been designed to fight Soviets in Russia, but, uh, in Europe, but how they could be uh, re reintegrated to fight wars in the third world. Well, that's more aggressive than Kissinger's earlier yeah. uh, posture. <clears throat> no, he's flat saying that the, the next wars will be in the third world as we cooperate with the Soviet Union. Wow, that's heavy. Mm. Well, John. Thank you for your <laughs> gloom and doom, but uh, heck, you got to look at the world the way it is, don't you? We've got a lot of work to do. Yeah. We've got a lot of work to do. We can't forget that the INF Treaty gave us all so much hope, but the factories are spitting out bombs faster than they've ever been, and they're now nine nations producing bombs. Well, it shows we have to reveal what's going on in these different CIA operations all over the world to try to publicize them. So hopefully people will be horrified if they know the truth yeah. of what's going on and the human consequences of these covert actions and just simply shut down these secret wars. Yes. Amen. Now let's have some information from alternative publications about the Defense Department. Should it be called the Defense Department when most of the Pentagon's budget is actually for offense? The percentage of it breaks down this way. 45% goes for intervention in third world countries. 27% goes to fight a possible world war in Europe. 13% for first strike capabilities such as Star Wars. 5% for miscellaneous such as NASA and the CIA and only 13% for defense of the United States. Only 13%. Well, how are your tax dollars spent? For every dollar you pay in income taxes, 52 cents will go for the military. And that includes, of course, a lot of CIA spending. Only two cents will go for housing. But who needs housing? Two cents will also go for education. But who needs education? 2% will go for food and for nutrition. <laughs> Who needs that? What about the human impact? Well, housing right now, 2 to 3 million people are homeless, and almost all of them are families. Rents have skyrocketed, and home ownership is almost a dream now, whereas it used to be normal. What about our education? Well, we know all about that. It's in a shambles. Weapons are commonplace in school, as are drugs. Serious teacher shortage, and the assistance by the federal government has severely been diminished. Health care. The AIDS epidemic spreads with no cure in sight. The U.S. has slipped to 19th in infant mortality rate and is the only industrialized country in the world without a national health program. And, of course, the effect has been devastating on the children with so many millions of them living in a state of poverty, without any health benefits, even basic immunizations. There are severe environmental problems, but meanwhile the government cuts the Environmental Protection Agency and relaxes environmental regulations, and most of the money still goes to the military. This information was prepared by the Jobs with Peace campaign in Boston, Massachusetts.
Many people have asked us to give the names and addresses of the publications which we use for news and other source material. The Guardian is a Marxist publication. The address is 33 West 17th Street, New York, New York, 10011. The Spotlight is a right-wing populist publication, 300 Independence Avenue, Southeast, Washington, D.C., 20003. For keeping up with the CIA and other intelligence organizations, it's the Covert Action Information Bulletin, P.O. Box 50272, Washington, D.C., 20004. The American Atheist is good for keeping up with church-state relationships and the religious right wing. P.O. Box 2117, Austin, Texas, 78768-2117. We would like to thank our crew, the people who helped us put on the program. Our director was Brian Lynch. He also set up the lights. Our audio person was Cheryl Johnson. Our camera people were Christy Swear and Brian Koningsdorf. Christy also was the editor for this program. We'd also like to thank Austin Community Television, ACTV, for the use of their equipment. Alternative Views is a production of the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. Please write to us. Goodbye.